Today on Straight Talk Africa, he was indeed the greatest. And some would say the people's champion both in and outside the ring. Muhammad Ali was regarded by Africans as their first truly African-American. U.S. President Barack Obama likens him the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and the Madiba himself, Nelson Mandela. That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, June 8th. I am Shaka Sali. And hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Mariama Diallo, your social media reporter. Today, we bring you a tribute to the greatest, Muhammad Ali. Indeed, Shaka, so many in our social media platform have expressed those thoughts. And coming up later in our, in, uh, in our STA inbox, we'll share those thoughts on our topic through emails, tweets, and Facebook comments. That's ahead on Straight Talk Africa. Hope you'll stay with us. Boxing legend Muhammad Ali was not only known for his incredible skill inside the ring, but he also was known for his activism outside the ring. My colleague, Paul Sisko, has more. Ali Bomaye, they chanted, days before Muhammad Ali's heavyweight championship fight with George Foreman in Kinshasa in 1974. Ali was not just a three-time world champion, but he was Africa's champion. He was an icon and inspiration to Africans, first as a fighter and forever for his beliefs. The native son of Louisville, Kentucky, first hit the world stage, winning an Olympic gold medal in the 1960 Rome Olympics. Some refer to Muhammad Ali as the first true African-American. His connection with Africa has long been deep and meaningful. I told you all that I was the greatest of all time. When I beat Thunder Liston, I told you today, I'm still the greatest of all time. The love and respect is mutual. Last night, I had a dream. When I got to Africa, I had one hell of a rumble. I had to beat Tarzans behind first for claiming to be the king in the jungle. For this fight, I've wrestled with alligators. I've tussled with a whale. I done handcuffed lightning and put thunder in jail. You know I'm bad. I have murdered a rock. I injured a stone and I hospitalized a brick. I'm so bad I make medicine sick. I'm so fast, man, I can run through a hurricane and don't get wet. When George Fulman meets me, he'll pay his debt. I can drown a drink of water and kill a dead tree. Wait till you see Muhammad Ali. The relationship between Ali and the continent was rooted in shared struggles and beliefs. The self-proclaimed Muslim championed Pan-Africanism. He met with Ghanaian nationalist leader Kwame Nkrumah and former Egyptian President Gabal Nassar and thousands of his African fans on a debut tour to Ghana, Nigeria, and Egypt. Ali was always treated as a hero wherever he went across the continent. The boxing icon visited Africa several times. First as Cassius Clay, and later as Muhammad Ali, the man often called the people's champion, never lacked confidence. You don't be a heart, it's gonna take a good man to whoop me. You can look at me, I'm loaded with confidence. I can't be me. I had 180 amateur fights, 22 professional fights, and I'm pretty as a girl. And in his own words, was pretty too. Never, never make me no underdog, and never talk about who's gonna stop me. Well, ain't nobody gonna stop me. Not a heavyweight in the world fast enough to stop me. I give you one more chance. Who's the greatest? You are. All right. In 1974, Muhammad Ali was hosted by President Mobutu Sese Seko in Kinshasa, Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo. The famed Rumble in the Jungle title fight against George Foreman gave Africans a front row seat to one of the defining moments of Ali's career and life. There he regained the heavyweight championship, which had been stripped from him in the late 1960s for refusing induction into the U.S. Armed Forces. Clay's induction refusal cost him his title, and he faces a possible five-year prison sentence. 60,000 fans in Kinshasa and millions of Africans across the continent and the world saw him knock out George Foreman. Others considered the 1975 Thrilla in Manila Ali's and boxing's greatest heavyweight fight. 
In the stifling Manila heat, he defeated Joe Frazier when Frazier's trainer refused to allow him to answer the bell for the 15th and final round. A friend and inspiration to generations, the powerful and the powerless, world leaders and presidents, Muhammad Ali had no greater admirer than Nelson Mandela. For years, we've known the eventual outcome of Muhammad Ali's fight against Parkinson's disease. We've also known that this battle would be fought with grace and style to the very end. The greatest, Muhammad Ali. Paul Sisko, VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that report. Um, joining us today are four distinguished guests. Sunny Young, VOA host, the Sunday side of sports. Ni Akuete, Executive Director, African Immigrant Caucus. Gentlemen, I have to say, I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the two of you on Straight Talk Africa. For the show. Thank you, Shaka. Pleasure to be here. You're most welcome. And of course, it's always a pleasure having you, really, Sunny. It's an honor to be with you on the, on the program with Sunny, too. The feeling is mutual, Ni Akwete. And Nandi Maweta, or Hollywood Nandi Maweta, a radio host and boxing promoter. He joins us from VOA Los Angeles Bureau. Well, Nandi, what a pleasure to see you on the screen from the City of the Angels. Pleasure is mine, a mighty Shaka. <laughs> You're most welcome. And last but not least, Ambassador Chintu Nyago, Ugandan Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations. He joins us, he joins us from the VOA UN Studios in New York. Well, Mr. Ambassador, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you, Shaka. The pleasure is also mine. Well, later in the program, We'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111. The U.S. country code is 1. Let me come to you uh, immediately, Sunny. Um, what was your immediate reaction when you got the news that the greatest had passed away on Friday? Tremendous sorrow uh, at the passing of... Uh, the man I consider the most significant, influential athlete of my times. Uh, I grew up with Muhammad Ali. Uh, I remember as a little boy watching his trilogy against Smoke and Joe Frazier, uh, staying up into the wee hours to watch the rumble in the jungle really? against Smoke and Joe Frazier, uh, excuse me, against George Foreman. And just a lot of his funny stuff with uh, Howard Cosell on Wide World of Sports, you know, like pulling at Howard's toupee and a lot of the funny things he would say. And uh, uh, I, I think Ali, uh, the, the Ali that I remember and that uh, I will always remember was uh, probably the, the Ali of the 70s, the, the one who fought anywhere mm -hmm. and he would fight anyone. It, it didn't matter. Uh, he fought all over the globe. His last fight was in the Bahamas, but he fought in Africa. He fought in the Philippines. He fought in Malaysia. He fought in Puerto Rico, all over the world. And so people all over the world got a chance to see his skills and his, uh, his verbosity. Uh, I consider him the first modern sports rapper with, with his verse and his uh, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. And he, he, he was just a a larger-than-life figure. Very interesting. Uh, what about you, Nia Quete? What was your first reaction? Well, you know, I, uh, I was stunned. Now, of course, as was mentioned in the intro, uh, he's been sick for a while, and then we even heard earlier in the week that he had checked into the hospital, but I thought that he would make it through. So when the news comes, it was like, wow, another giant has left. It, it brought a lot of memories back to me. My very first memory of, of hearing of him, of course, was the Sonny Liston fight. But then three months later, he was in Accra, the city in which I was born, visiting uh, President Nkrumah, spent two weeks in, in Ghana, went to Kumasi. So he dominated the news. Now, of course, for the past several decades, I've lived in Washington as an activist, working on policy issues. And my admiration of him 
In fact, my wonderment at his skills have deepened because now I look at him as not just a skilled boxer, not just an audacious man, but his ability to change public policy. I mean, he stands on his refusal to go to Vietnam. And initially, this country wasn't as much against mm. Vietnam as, uh, as he was. And then it all turned around, and you have to credit him, because for those mm. three years, he <coughs> went around campuses mm. talking to students about why he wouldn't go. Then, of course, he was a big Pan-Africanist. And then, beyond that, you have to look at his stance against colonialism and imperialism and refusal to go to Vietnam. And, of course, he switched religions. So he was a global figure. So my respect for him as a, a, an activist, a global activist, and somebody who embraced Pan-Africanism uh, is, 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 is awesome. And I'm still trying to process that such a giant has left. And I'm wondering whether we did injustice when, when he was around. Hollywood, Nandi Moweta, your reaction, Friday. Mm. Well, Shaka, he passed on on the Friday in the special month, the month of Ramadan. Uh, he's been living with this pain from the world of boxing. Uh, Allah has welcomed him. He's at peace. And in, uh, I think uh, we will never forget Muhammad Ali. I still remember watching that fight at 3 a.m. in Lagos, Nigeria. The eight-round knockout, the whole city exploded, you know, <laughs> and uh, his legacy will always live on. Very interesting. Uh, now, of course, uh, you talked about uh, 3 a.m. in Lagos, and he, of course, uh, Sunny Young was telling us, uh, waking up to watch the rumble in the jungle, <laughs> boy, the match, in fact, uh, had been rigged in the favor of the Americans. It is the Africans <laughs> that had to wake up very, very early in the morning. And I remember, in fact, waking up very early in the morning in the Ugandan capital Kampala around 4 a.m. <laughs> But, Shaka, don't forget that the Americans were the ones that were paying the bulk of the money from pay-per-view. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> the Africans put up the money, which was $5 million a piece per fighter. Uh, the bulk of the rest of the money was coming in from the U.S. and the rest of the world. And that was 8 p.m. prime time in the U.S. Very interesting. <laughs> uh, now, of course, uh, uh, Hollywood, Nandi Maweta, I know, of course, that you are, among other things, a boxing promoter. What would you say that was perhaps the, the, uh, the effect, really, from the rumble in the jungle to African boxers? I'm talking, of course, uh, 1994 fight between then world champion George Foreman and then challenger Muhammad Ali. Well, Shaka, after that fight, uh, there was something all the kids were doing in the neighborhood called the alley shuffle, the rope-a-dope. <laughs> as, <we tra> <laughs> as we travel around Africa, putting on shows, if it's Bukam in Ghana or in Lagos, Nigeria, the, the, the mainland the boxing club, or in Soweto, all, all the young ones are practicing the alley shuffle, the rope-a-dope, <laughs> and his fast hands. But we cannot, I mean, we cannot uh, forget that. He brought a lot to the game, and right after the rumble in the jungle, the sports of boxing really, really came alive, and lots of other boxers came up uh, right after that because he brought a lot into the game in Africa. Now, what do you think is likely to be his lasting, his lasting legacy, Hollywood Moweta? Uh, what he stood for, what he fought for, and the fact that uh, he's the first fighter to be a global ambassador. I mean, the first fighter to have that global reach. What we have today is a bunch of pretenders. Uh, if you ask me today, who is the heavyweight champion of the world? Can you name one or two? No. I can't but during the days of Muhammad. Can't hear you. During the days of Muhammad Ali, you say, who is the heavyweight champion of the world? You can say, yes, it's Muhammad Ali. It's Muhammad Ali. Hmm. What, what about uh, some who say um, Hollywood Nandi Moweta that, uh, yes, uh, Muhammad Ali was obviously a great, great boxer, uh, but that perhaps uh, he basically used boxing, really, as a platform to accomplish other larger goals. Uh, mainly, we're talking about uh, his role in the civil rights, we're talking about uh, his humanitarian aspect. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, those are things that will always be said when we mention Muhammad Ali. 
Um, today in the game, Floyd Mayweather, who is like the number one box, boxer in the, on, on the planet today, he will not be able to do what Muhammad Ali has been able to do over the years, what he stood for, uh, the friendship he developed, not only in Africa, around the globe. Very interesting, Nandi. Hollywood, uh, Nandi Mawet, of course, uh, it was a pleasure, of course, having you on Straight Talk Africa, and we look forward to having you again next time around. Thanks a lot. You're most welcome. Now we'll pause for a short break, and would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website Twitter, and we are tweeting live. Follow us at VOA Shaka, that's VOA Shaka, and join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA Muhammad Ali. And we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa, become a fan, and connect with other friends of the Voice of America. After a short break, former World Heavyweight Champion Ali Holmes will join us. This is Straight Talk Africa on the Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question. Keep your comment brief and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back. Uh, but before we continue with the program, we are delighted to be joined from Eastern Pennsylvania by a telephone link up by the one and only Larry Holmes, a former World Heavyweight Champion and International Hall of Fame inductee. Good afternoon, uh, Larry Holmes. Hello, how are you? I am hugely terrific. Uh, I have to say, frankly, that uh, I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to host you for the first time on Straight Talk Africa. Well, thank you very much. You know, I'm glad to be on the show. This will be my first time, or maybe the second or third time, that I've been on any show from Africa. This is really nice. You're most welcome. We hope that um, one of these days uh, you will grace this Studio 52 here in Washington, D.C. What about that? That sounds even better. That's closer to me. You're most welcome. Uh, talk to me, uh, Lale. What was your immediate reaction when you got the news that the well, greatest had well, passed away? Well, I kind of like expected because, uh, you know, a few months ago I was down there in, in Louisville with him and uh, he didn't look too good. And I said to my wife, I don't know about that. I said, uh, I don't think he got too much longer. He don't look good because he didn't talk. He didn't just sit there, just stood. And, you know, I was, like, worried, you know, I, and I didn't want to go back and see him again. But um, I went back and seen him again. He was still the same, doing the same thing. So, but I kind of expected, but one of the things about it hurt me. It hurt me because not only he was a friend of mine, but I think he was one of the greatest fighters ever lived in, the, in this world. Very interesting. Uh, you happen to be one of the elite five boxers that, in fact, uh, defeated at one time Muhammad Ali. But yet again, you happen perhaps to be a very unique individual, given that you were his former sparring partner, lasting about five, four years, a friend, and of course, uh, eventually a world heavyweight champion. Uh, what was it like uh, to fight Muhammad Ali? You know, it wasn't it wasn't good pleasure fighting Muhammad because you know he was my friend and he was my boss, <laughs> and then I had to fight him. You know, but then it was the money thing. You know, if I if I beat him, I, I I'd be the old man. If I lost, I never had anything. So you know, my thing was not to take take it hard on him because you know I knew how he would fight and I knew that I could beat him. So I don't want to hurt Muhammad Ali because he's he is my friend. And so when we fought, you know, I told him, don't get hurt. Just don't go crazy. I did. I said, I don't want to hurt nobody. I don't want you to be hurt. And, uh, you know, he told me, shut up and fight, you know. And uh, I did what I had to do without hurting him, I think. I don't think I hurt him. And, uh, you know, we remained friends because right after the fight, I went back to his dressing room and, and I told him, I gave him a hug and told him I love him. And he said, if you love me, why you beat me up like that, man? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, you know, he was he was a great man and he didn't take he didn't he wasn't angry with me or nothing like that because it was about the money. He got ten million dollars and you know, back then they, that was a lot of money, you know. So he was happy and we we remained friends even after the fight. Any particular reason, uh, really, why you cried uh, after the boat? Uh, you don't seem really to have enjoyed the fight. I don't enjoy the fight. He was my friend. He was my boss. You know what I mean? You know, he was a guy that helped teach me how to fight. I mean, when I first went with him in 1971, I was just an amateur. I was learning how to fight. And he gave me the opportunity to come to his camp and work out with him, uh, you know, and learn from him. He gave me that opportunity. When I worked out with Muhammad Ali for the very first time, we went to Reddy, Pennsylvania, and he gave me gloves and shoes, everything to box with, and he gave me the opportunity to box. And when he boxed with me, of course, he gave me the black eye, right? He gave me the black eye, and I loved it. And I said, it's okay. He wanted to put ice on my eye, and I won't let him put ice. He goes, why? I said, because I'm showing this off Muhammad Ali. Hit me in my eye. I said, God, this is a, this is this is nice. I can show it off. And you know, he told me I was crazy. Put the mic, but I never put ice. And then when I got home, I bragged about Muhammad Ali boxing me and giving me a black eye. It was a brag. Yeah, I bragged about it. Now, knowing him the way you did, and of course, you have to be one of the few very unique individuals that do that. Uh, uh, do mm -hmm. you sincerely feel? Do you sincerely think that uh, it was necessary? for Muhammad Ali to fight the last two fights. I'm talking about yours and the one of Trevor Babic in the Bahamas. Yeah, well, Trevor Babic he didn't need to fight, but what it was about was the money. It was about the money with Ali. He started fighting for money after he couldn't beat me. He just said, I'll take a fight with money. And, and I didn't like that fight. I didn't think he should have took it. But again, you can't tell people what to do. Because, you know, the man, when I do tell him that he's a champ, I said, shut up. He can do what he want to do, so I don't say anything. Well, he was the champ. In my opinion, he was always going to be the champ. So, you know, the Burbick fight, the Trevor Burbick fight, Trevor Burbick didn't fight the Ali that I fought. If he did, he would have got beat. Well, given that uh, you, again, happen to be one of the few people that um, interacted with him in a very special manner, what is it that uh, during that experience, really, that you learned? What did you learn from him, and what did that interaction mean to you? Hey, listen, I got the best jab in boxing. I had the best jab in boxing because of Muhammad Ali, because I tried to keep up with him. And when he threw the jab, I want to throw the jab. I want to beat him to the jab because everybody knew how Ali was. Everybody knew that he was a good jabber. He always jabbed right hand combination. And I wanted to be like that, so I worked on that to beat him to the jab. And that's why I that's why I lasted so long in boxing because I had a good jab. Everybody had to worry about the Larry Holmes jab. And then when they worried about the Larry Holmes jab, then they had to worry about the right. And so they couldn't do both. And I was able to win the fight. What was it like uh, being with him in Zaire back in 1974? I'm talking about uh, the Rambo in the jungle. In the jungle. I was there with him. I was there with Muhammad Ali, with the Rambo in the jungle in Zaire. And, and he trained good. I mean, you know, people love him. Ali Dumaye. Ali Dumaye. <laughs> <laughs> Ali killed him. Ali killed him. Yeah, yeah that, and you know, there's all I, a lot of people that we that didn't speak good English, but they know how to say Ali Boumaye. We didn't know how to speak African, so we said Ali Boumaye. <laughs> you know, we said the same thing, Ali Boumaye, Ali Boumaye. And it was, it was neat. And people, everywhere you go, people love you. You know, they run after, they take little kids running behind the car, Ali, Ali, Ali. I mean, you know, it was mind-boggling. And you know what Ali said? He said, boy, he said, you're home. This is home, man. This is what our people look like. This is, this is what we look like. He, and, you know, he was, he was very proud to be in Zaire. And I was just as proud as he was because I was with the greatest fighter of all time. Any particular reason why the people preferred Ali to the champion himself, George Foreman? George Foreman, George Foreman, though, it was okay boxer, but, you know, I, but George Foreman, they didn't like George Foreman. I mean, you know, 
because because Ali, they loved Ali. They didn't like George Foreman because George Foreman wasn't no Muhammad Ali, and and people uh, everywhere Ali go, people go with him. But George, they didn't do that with George. Let so it, I don't, let, I, I a, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was gonna, I was gonna say that that's okay because I didn't like George either. <laughs> I see, I see. Well, I gather that uh, he couldn't uh, autograph your uh, boxing gloves. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very interesting, very interesting. Uh, have you been to Africa, Lale, since 1974? And if not, when do you plan to do so? I did not go to Zaire, but I've been to different parts of Africa already. Yeah, I've been to different parts. Africa, but I've never been back to Zaire. But I would like to go back to Zaire, and I and I and I met some Africans here, and they always tell me that they're going to send for me, and they're going to make arrangements for me to come there, but they never do. And I, they just told me they're going to do it. Matter of fact, last week I got a call and saying that Larry, we want you to come to Africa, but that's the last thing I heard. Nobody bring me over, so. Final question, Lale. What is it, what is it like uh, to be a world heavyweight champion of the world? And you were for many years. Well, it was an honor to be the heavyweight champion of the world. It's an honor to, work, to represent black fighters that could be able to do something. It was, a, it was great to honor white fighters if they work hard enough, they can be something. You know, it, 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 it reminds it, it means something when anybody that works hard as I work can be anything that they want to be. You know, whether you're black, whether you're white, or orange, or green color, I don't care. If you work at something, you can always be that. Ali was living proof that if you work at it, you can be it. And he he was one example. He, he more like boxing, and he would go down as one of the greatest fighters of all time. And I'm just glad to say that I was one of the guys who helped him become one of the great fighters of all time. Lale, do I take it as a commitment that uh, you will indeed uh, come here in Washington, Studio 52, on Straight Talk Africa one of these days? Yeah, I'm hoping that I will do that. Thank you very much. I think we should be able to arrange that and talk about going on a trip to the motherland, Africa. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Okay, bye. It was a pleasure. Well, very interesting. Your reaction, Sandy? Yeah, I, uh, I loved listening to Larry Holmes. Uh, what I got from a wonderful interview, Shaka, uh, was uh, how much he loved Ali. Uh, and also the, the conflict in having to beat Ali well past his prime uh, as, a former fr as a former sparring partner and a friend, a good friend of Muhammad Ali. But also what I heard was how much Ali taught him yes. with the jab yes. and, and uh, how he learned from the greatest and became a heavyweight champion in his own right. In yeah. fact, uh, he says that uh, he basically uh, happened to live uh, uh, in a generation of professors of boxing, really. And he talks about Muhammad Ali. He talked, of course, about uh, George Foreman and, of course... Joe Frazier. Maybe the greatest period ever for the heavyweight division in the 70s. Uh, I, I also loved what he said about how the, the, uh, the Congolese, how they reacted to Foreman yes. for the rumble in the jungle. And, and that was a different Vis -a -vis George. Vis -a -vis that was a different Ali. George. Mm -hmm. He was a, a scowling type of guy back then. But he was a young man. He was, he was a young 25, man. really. Yeah, he, he, had not yet, he hadn't started selling the grills yet. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, it, so yeah, Ali was uh, treated like a king when he came there. And a king he was. <laughs> well, you are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment, but first here is Mariam Jero. Take it away, Mariam. Well, thanks, Shaka. Still to come, we'll reveal some of the outstanding and fantastic feedback we've received from our audience through social media. But now, here is our letter of the week from a Straight Talk Africa Facebook fan. Louis Ahimbisibwe from Uganda writes... I believe in defiance because it really works. Imagine where the black race would be 
if black heroes like Muhammad Ali, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and others didn't defy the white suppression. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number 202-619-3111. And the U.S. country code is 1. Call us collects and we'll pay for the call. Or call directs and we'll call you right back. Remember to keep your questions brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidu, you want, and welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Mariama. Take it away again, Mariama. Shaka, I can probably start saying, ah, Lee, Bombaye, and just remembering all those, uh, the, those wonderful memories about, uh, indeed, the greatest uh, sports fans and admirers of Muhammad Ali across the globe are um, today uh, remembering and mourning their hero after it was announced that the former world heavyweight boxing champion, 1960 Olympic light heavyweight gold medalist and influential social activist had died. Well, this leads us to our question of the week, which asks, does the passing of the greatest Muhammad Ali mark the end of an era? Before we begin, I'd like to thank you all for using all our social media platform to communicate with us. And another reminder that we are tweeting live today. Just use the hashtag VOA Muhammad Ali. And if you haven't yet, do follow us at VOA Shaka. And speaking of it, let's go to a tweet from Martin Yalusi from Tanzania, who tweets that Ali will be remembered for being a black man who showed the world that black people can make it. Now to a comment from one of uh, our Facebook followers, uh, Omunua Okugbo Igodalo from Nigeria, who writes, Muhammad Ali was a principal part of an unforgettable generation. He was more of a global statesman than a boxer. Hence, he fought far more significant battles outside the boxing ring. Muhammad Ali worked tirelessly for a world where every human being had dignity because he had an active and living conscious. Well, some powerful comments here just showing uh, just how much he's meant to so many people out there. Shaka and guests, your take. Indeed, uh, indeed. Uh, Ambassador Kin Tunyago, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Shaka. Your reaction, sir, your reaction to what we just had. Uh, well, thank you, Shaka. I would just begin by uh, complimenting to, on what the great, the great boxing legend uh, Larry Holmes uh, talked about why Muhammad Ali was much loved in Kinshasa as compared to George Foreman. Ali, it was a, Ali deliberately spent more time in Kinshasa before the fight. And also he, related, he interacted more intimately with the people, jogging, talking to them. And that, that, that helped him to create what we can call uh, some, a synergy or some kind of chemistry between him and the people. Well, plus the fact that he was an icon by then, after having refused to go to the, to, to be drafted into the Vietnam War. But I mean, it was a, deliberately, I really liked the people, and he spent more time with the people, related with the people, and also attempted to identify with their culture. And that was very, very critical in terms of Ali's uh, creating the synergy and, this, and the chemistry between himself and the ordinary people in Kinshasa. Now in Africa you find that Ali was also viewed as an icon and people are mourning because you find that say the Nelson Mandela Foundation has sent its condolence messages. P uh, leaders like President Museveni also sent their condolence messages. And also in Uganda you find that uh, there's a special attachment between uh, the boxing fraternity and Muhammad Ali in the sense that in 1960, one of our boxing coaches informed us that he trained Muhammad Ali in Rome. And this again, points out to Muhammad Ali's uh, humble nature and wanting to relate with people because Muhammad Ali, who was 18 then and Amer in the American team, in the Olympic team, came over and politely requested uh, Mr. Tom Kawere, who was the coach for the Ugandan team. He wanted to train with Africans. And Mr. Kawere did, uh, uh, accepted Ali for three main reasons, because he was black, that's point one, but point two was because uh, Ali was polite to him. 
and then he allowed him. But I mean, it was unusual for a coach to allow somebody from a, a competing team to come and train with him. And then he allowed Ali to train as a young man, and he was impressed by Ali. And Kaur also points out that he did give one or two tips to Muhammad Ali. So Muhammad Ali is somebody who is really uh, a very a good icon, a, a role model to many people. And also, we remember him because of his activism. And uh, we should not forget that he, he sacrificed four of his best, best mm. years in life as a sportsman. Because when he refused to be drafted, that was the best time as a sportsman. I mean, in boxing, you can't do it forever, like, say, in some of the other activities. So the best time in his life, he sacrificed it. And he lost a lot of opportunity and money. But, I mean, he, he stood by his principle. And that's very, very important. Plus the fact that, he, as, as we have mentioned, he, 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 he eventually actually even became a statesman. He became a statesman in America because we should remember that, because he met in the White House, I think, four presidents, including Reagan, Mr. Bush, G.W. Bush gave him a medal. He met uh, Mr., Mr. Clinton and Mr. Barack Obama. So he became, uh, you know, even a statesman within America. And even I do remember President Carter did send him on an emissary to Africa, I think, in 1980. Very interesting. Uh, well, um, in addition to... Uh the interaction between uh, uh, then box, of course, uh, Cassius Clay in 1960 in Rome uh, with the Ugandan team, which was, of course, uh, coached by Etom Kawere. Uh, he, Muhammad Ali also happened to have visited Uganda uh, in 1989 and uh, took some pictures, in fact, with Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni, uh, who made some remarks suggesting that uh, Ali, uh, in Museveni's words, optimized the things like uh, discipline, determination, and defense for the marginalized people. Ali, he said, he added, was also a revolutionary in his own right. What did he really, what was he looking Very for? True. Hmm? What was Ali looking for? He seems to have uh, a thirst or, or a curiosity for Africa, a land perhaps where his ancestors well, came from. Well, you must appreciate uh, the, the historical context under which Ali grew up. I mean, uh, in the 1960s, uh, uh, Jim Crow rose in America. I mean, the, uh, black people didn't have uh, much of a say. So that was the, the background. And then you find that uh, within that context, he emerges as a very talented young man. And for some reason, for some reason, I, I guess, based on the way he was brought up or whatever it was, he, he had very strong conviction. Plus the fact that well, he related with uh, the, the, uh, Elijah Muhammad of the black, uh, black Muslim na nation of Islam. All, all that, I think, informed his consciousness. And then one other thing, uh, Shaka, that we should recall about Muhammad Ali was, is the fact that currently you find that many people associate Islam with violence. But Muhammad Ali, as a Muslim, who became eventually even a Sunni Muslim, was a peaceful person, and he used to profess uh, loudly and clearly and very articulately to everybody who could listen to him that Islam is a peaceful religion and as really exemplified by his own character. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, Mariama, thank you a lot for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Well, thank you, Shaka. That will do it for today's social media segment. Just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please keep them coming. If you are a new fan, just drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com. Or post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com or you can join our YouTube channel. Sign up to VOA TV to Africa and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. A reminder that the show is streaming live every Wednesday. Just go to the VOA Straight Talk Africa TV program page on our website or simply watch us live on your mobile device. Just download the VOA mobile app. Now, let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on Straight Talk Africa, we'll discuss African Liberation Day. Join host Shaka Sali, his panel of guests, and me, your social media reporter, as we talk about the African Union. That's next week, right here on Straight Talk Africa. 
Welcome back, and today we bring you a tribute to the greatest, Muhammad Ali. Our distinguished guest, uh, Sunny Yang himself, VOA host of Sunny Side of Sports, Ni Akwete, Executive Director, African Immigrant Caucus, and Ambassador Kintu Nyago, Ugandan Permanent Representative to the United Nations. He joins us from VOA's UN Studios in New York. Well, gentlemen, uh, I have to say again that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the three of you on Straight Talk Africa. The pleasure all belongs to us. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Thank you, Shaka. Thank you, Shaka. You're most welcome indeed. Uh, well, you obviously had uh, the exploits of uh, young Muhammad Ali and his thirst for the motherland of Africa. You know, sometimes people forget, by the way, that uh, Muhammad Ali initially, it is interesting how he found himself a boxer. He was, the story goes, 12 years young. Somebody steals his bicycle. <laughs> a Schwinn. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes to report the case to a police officer, who was, I think, a Joe Marty. Yes. And he says, if I catch this thief, I'm going to hop him. <laughs> and Joe um, suggested to him that, you know what? You may, you know, you may want to... Take up boxing, learn a bit of boxing. And that's how Muhammad Ali, in six years' time from then, wins, yes. can you believe, an Olympic gold medal for the United States? An Olympic gold medal, light heavyweight. He takes it back to Louisville. You know it's called the Louisville Leap. Yes. He can't even have a meal in a restaurant in his neighborhood. Yes. He's not, in fact acknowledged by his neighbors, really, as an American hero. He, he's a hero with an aesthetic. Yes. What does he do? He throws his medal in the river, which, of course, was re, uh, replaced in 1996, the Atlanta Olympics, when he held the torch. Yes. Your reaction? Well, you know, I mean, he was such a talented man. I think he had many, many, many facets. So I'm one of the people who think that he used his amazing bo boxing skills to do other things. As you mentioned, I mean, in six years, from a 12-year-old to an 18-year-old, he was a world champion. And Mr. Martin mentioned what, uh, uh, what great discipline he had, how much he trained. I think Larry Holmes also mentioned it, that when they were in Zaire, he trained a lot. And then his courage. But I do think what will last after him, and of course I'm speaking in a biased way as an uh, activist, that is activism, his global work, including humanitarian work, going to Ivory Coast to help uh, refugees from Liberia during the Civil War. So I think he's, he's going to be more than just a sportsman. He's going to be a towering historical figure. He is. It is interesting that uh, soon after beating uh, Sonny Liston, in Florida. Guess where he goes first? To the Republic of Ghana, yes. which had regained its political independence in 1957 yes. from the British, whose president, or at that time, in fact, President 64, Kwame Nkrumah, Correct. had actually been mentored by, among others, one of African Americans or American giant intellectuals. W.E.B. Du Bois, yes. who had actually been buried in Accra in 1963. That is precisely the George case. George Padmore himself. Yes, yes. And, you know, Nkrumah had, Nkrumah schooled in the United States. Correct, 10 years. Uh, yes, 10 mm -hmm. years. He got, he got three degrees. He got to in Lincoln, the, <laughs> yes. University of Pennsylvania. Yes. He probably did some work at Howard. He did some work at Howard. So he had a great American connection. He had a great American connection with African Americans. In fact, initially he had thought about becoming a, a priest, priest. <laughs> and, and therefore he had preached in African American uh, uh, churches because, before he became an activist. You know, he is uh, seen as a, rightly seen as a huge Pan-African leader. But in fact, there were growth of Pan-Africanism in the United States that he picked up on. The Pan-African Conference that Nkrumah helped organize in the UK was number five. 
W.E.B. Du Bois, George Padmore, the great Marcus Garvey. All these people had uh, uh, influence on Nkrumah. So Nkrumah what about had a great What about Father Divine? <laughs> yeah, of course, yes. So the fact that Muhammad Ali showed up, and if I might say, you know, I was a little boy in Accra. When he showed up in Ghana in May 1964, I can tell you it was an explosion over the country. Everywhere he went, people lined up. And of course, at that time, there were other African Americans. Uh, Malcolm X came through, Maya Angelou, a, a whole host. That, that was the place. Um, one, somebody just wrote that in the 1960s, Ghana was the place to be if you were a Pan Africanist and an activist and against imperialism. It was the Mecca, just like uh, Dar es Salaam, the yes. commercial capital of Tanzania, <laughs> became yes. in the 70s. Sunny Young, you are an American who happened to be a white American. You have this kid, Muhammad Ali, frankly, who seems to be a guy that transcends races, really, cultures, you name it. He is even a Muslim. According to Islam, when you die before the sun sets, they have to bury you that day. <laughs> if not, they bury you the following day. But here is the kid from Louisville. He is a Muslim in his own right, but guess what? He's been given an option. They are burying him a week later. He transcended races, as, as you said, Shaka. Uh, I never met Muhammad Ali, but I do have a family Muhammad Ali story that really illustrates the people's champion. This was a few years after his final fight. It was the early 1980s. Mm. And my parents were at Hartford International Airport with my only sister. Mm -hmm. And they were standing at a rental car counter. My father looks across the foyer of the airport. Who was standing at another rental car counter but Muhammad Ali? By himself with no entourage. My father recognized him. He kind of gives him a little wave. Muhammad Ali walked across the foyer mm -hmm. to meet my parents really? and my sister. Uh, that, to me, illustrates what kind of man he was. He, he was the people's champion. He loved all people. The people's champion, indeed. Uh, there are so many stories. Uh, you know, people will tell you in Los Angeles, for example, he would actually even go to places where people like him wouldn't even get anywhere near, really. Uh, places where... People are so poor, homeless, and all that kind of stuff. And Muhammad Ali will be there uh, trying to, uh, you know, to add some value. In fact, as rich as he was, as famous as he was, when I was at UCLA in Los Angeles, he lived nearly somewhere downtown. Mm. Very downtown, not really in some of these exclusive places like uh, Beverly Hills, Brentwood, Bel Air, you name it. He never went there. <laughs> And I liked how you mentioned him holding the, uh, lighting the cauldron at yes. the 1996 Olympic Games. Yes. Uh, you know, his career in boxing was far from, I mean, it was, it was over by many years at that point. Right. Yes. But emotionally, I remember, I remember watching on television when he, when he uh, lit the cauldron. I, I was just overcome with, you know, tears and, yes. and joy. And it, it was almost a symbol of how much Muhammad Ali had been had come full circle. Very interesting. Full circle with being welcomed by society. Well, we have to go to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. Uh, good evening, Tafa from the Republic of Ghana. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Hello, good evening, Shaka. You did a terrific. How are you today, Tafa? I'm great, Shaka. And what are, what are you too? I am terrific. What is your question, my, my friend? Time is not our best ally. Yeah. Thank you very much. Chuck, I admire, I admire Muhammad Ali a lot. You know the reason why my father used to talk about him a lot. And what happened is that my father passed away within a few hours. I heard about passing away of Ali Muhammad. Uh, Shaka, what I admire him about is yesterday I was watching a television and one of his very good friends was talking about how Muhammad Ali connected himself with Africa. Mm -hmm. According to this man, he said Muhammad Ali asked him to call somebody from Africa, but he doesn't want any president or any minister should be called. He wants the man of ordinary African, he wants to talk to the ordinary African person. In fact, uh, Shaka, I was very touched. 
I was very touched. This man has shown a love to Africans, and I believe we will continue to love him. Today, there's a lot of athletes in America who are also very great, but they are not showing any concern to us Africans. So you can see that there's no connection to such uh, people. But when you look at Muhammad Ali, he has shown a lot of love Africa. Very That's interesting. why everybody in Africa is mourning today. Very interesting, very interesting. Thank you so much, Tafa, all the way from Ghana. Let's go to the other side of the continent. Uh, good evening, somewhere from Uganda. You're most welcome, Straight Talk Africa. Uh, good evening, Ndugushaka, how are you? I am hugely terrific. How are you, Samuel? I'm very terrific, and thank you very much for bringing in uh, uh, Samuel Young. You're most uh, welcome, Ndugu. I'm one of the recipients of Samuel Young's goodies. Wow, <laughs> you're the man, Sunny. So the Samuel, man. The, you, the delivery came, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're yeah, like a Muhammad Ali of sorts. You, you share some very <laughs> goodies. You, you, you can remember my, my, my voice. Now, uh, I straight away go to Samuel Young. How can you, uh, you, uh, sports, uh, uh, your sports uh, section and segment assist African continent in maintaining the Muhammad Ali legacy? And how can uh, young boxers in Africa uh, be able to be included in the uh, academy in the United States and Europe? Thank you, Shaka, and please thank you, uh, Sammy Young. It's nice seeing you once again. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you, too. Go for it. Yeah, uh, interesting question. Uh, uh, you know, maybe that it would be better served by Namdi Moweta in Los Angeles, but uh, I, I think I think that uh, there are some African fighters that have come to the United States for training purposes, but I think it's a very small number uh, in terms that are actually based here in the United States. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it brings up uh, a, a great possibility that maybe there can be some sort of uh, cross-continent uh, dialogue and programs for developing African fighters mm -hmm. here in the United States where there, there are better facilities. Uh, in fact, that's one of the points that Namdi always makes, that if you really want to make it mm -hmm. in prize fighting, you need to come to the United States and base yourself in one of the hotbeds for boxing, I, I Los Angeles or Las Vegas, that type of thing. I hear you. Let's go to the great nation of Nigeria. Of course, we have Patrick. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Good evening, Mr. Saka. Good evening, Mr. Sonny Young, the sports expert. <laughs> terrific, terrific. Uh, Patrick, what is your question, please? What is your question? Uh, yeah, we have to Patrick Okura for here in Anotoku in Nigeria. Oh, my, good evening, Mr. Saka. On behalf of my family and the uh, Okrafo's family here, and uh, we send a heart pet sympathy to the government of America and uh, Muhammad Ali's family. Muhammad Ali, as we know, died a hero, an icon, and a disabled young man. He played a very good role in boxing and a disciplined young man. Mr. Sonny Young, sir, sports lovers in Nigeria, where can we go and sign our own condolence register here in Nigeria? The sports that the boxing lovers, where do we go and sign our own paper? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mohamed Ali. One minute, please. please. Where, do we, where do we go? Yeah. To sign a, a book of condolence if you are oh, in Nigeria. Oh, that's a great question. That should be uh, answered perhaps by the State Department. Yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer yeah. to that question. Very interesting, very interesting. Uh, Ambassador, uh, keen to, it's not that we forgot you really, uh, but I'm sure that you are still there. Talk to us about how you felt when yes. you were a young kid uh, back in Masaka in 19... 74, the Rambo in the jungle. Why did you wake up so early? <coughs> to watch Muhammad Ali or yes, we... to watch both? Or was it just Muhammad Ali as a matter of fact? Well, uh, I, we were in, I was in a boarding school then in Masaka, you very correctly. And uh, by that time, Ali had uh, emerged as an icon. He had emerged as an icon for a variety of reasons. To begin with, his intellectual ability, I mean, the way he was, his poetry and, uh, and wit. And then, I mean, he's, uh, he's speaking the truth, telling the truth to power. 
I'm refusing to go to Vietnam. Now, all those were things that some, some of which we couldn't really appreciate, but I mean, Ali's uh, became a, 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 a significant symbol in our young minds and helped to crystallize our understanding of some of those struggles say, taking place in the civil rights and then the Vietnam War itself. So when Ali was set free, and uh, Foreman by then was a legend because it, uh, Foreman was not like Ali. Foreman he was a knockout specialist. <laughs> Within a few seconds, he'd win any other person. <laughs> so when Ali and uh, Foreman were, 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 you know, were brought together to fight, I mean, that was something that was really hyped in our, in our country. And uh, Ali by then, as I've mentioned, was, uh, was an icon. And Foreman also was a legend. So we had to wake up very, very early in the morning, and people were saying that Ali could not defeat Foreman, given Foreman's uh, you know, vibrancy and all that. And after waking up, and then in the eighth round, as you know very well, Ali emerged and uh, you know, knocked out Foreman, and that really captured our imagination. And uh, Ali, I mean, that, that was Muhammad Ali at his best. Plus, one of the fights he had against Smoking Joe Frazier. Now, Mr. Basada, of course, uh Muhammad Ali was a human being and therefore not perfect. Uh, how do you respond to some of his critics who say, yes, he may have loved Africa, uh, but he really used to wine and dine with African dictators. For example, Mobutu Sese Seko. Uh, what about, in fact, even Marcos in the Philippines, a country that was under uh, martial law at that time? And of course, uh, Marcos was not a Democrat. Well, uh, it's a complex, uh, we're in a complex world. I mean, Ali could not change the world. But uh, coming to Mobutu, Mobutu had his faults, but uh, you can't compare Mobutu to, say, the, the Belgian, uh, the Belgian uh, colonial rulers. The and uh, I think Mobu uh, Ali wanted to fight in Africa, and the only country that had, had the, the, the political will to host the rumble in the jungle was uh, Mr. Mobutu, who had the means. And I think that's the background to which. And, uh, well, I think it helps to get, raise the consciousness of the Congolese and uh, make them feel happy. And, uh, well, it's a complex issue, but I think it was a worthy, a worthy cause. And uh, the continent identified with Ali when he came to Africa. I mean, look, there uh, has never been a similar fight in Africa. Not many people would like to come to Africa. And then, as I mentioned, unlike Mr. Foreman, who came and stayed in a four-star hotel or five-star hotel in Kinshasa a week or so before the fight, Ali took time and came to Kinshasa earlier on. And that's one of the reasons as to why the crowd in Kinshasa loved him. The ordinary people, forget about Mobutu, the ordinary people in Kinshasa. Ali spent more time with the ordinary Kinoa, the ordinary people in the slums of Kinshasa. In fact, he stayed uh, at a village a neighborhood called Nsele, uh, which was like uh, an hour outside of uh, the city of Kinshasa. Uh, but having said that, what about the priorities, frankly, of some of these African leaders? Yes, the public relations uh, uh, maybe uh, impact, you might say, was uh, incredible. But what about an ordinary Zairean citizen, frankly, who probably couldn't, frankly, have access to service delivery from his own government? Should that one also be happy? As I've said, Ali couldn't change the world, but I think as a, it was a very significant symbol, and uh, what he stood for was, is very vivid in our minds. He stood against uh, oppression and injustice. And uh, regarding what happened in Congo, that's, I mean, uh, I, I would imagine Mr. Mobutu did um, significantly much more than what the Belgians did. Thank you. Thank of, you. For example, educating the, the Congolese and so forth. Time, yes. time is not, uh, unfortunately, time is not a best ally, Mr. Ambassador, but thank you so much. On that note, thanks to our distinguished guests, Sunny Yang, VOA host, the sunny side of sports. Ni Akwete, Executive Director, African Immigrant Caucus, and Ambassador Kintu Nyago, Ugandan Permanent Representative to the United Nations. He joined us from VOA UN Studios in New York. Thanks to our affiliate stations, along with our viewers and listeners. We thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning is Daybreak Africa with James Bate. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better, Africa. And Muhammad Ali lives, at least in the spirit. Now, remember, of course, to keep the African hopes 